Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 31 in which we'll examine the fossil record of horsetails. Now you've likely seen a horsetail plant. They often grow in wetlands or near creeks and streams or along rivers and the edges of ponds. This also goes by the common names of puzzle grass or snake grass. Now botanists classify horsetails within the group Spiniopsida or the Equisotopsidae or they're often called the Equitalis which means the horsetails. Now the remarkable thing about horsetails and distinguishes them from all other plants is the unique way in which they grow and exhibit vascularization within their stems. Now each tall blade is composed of segmented stems that you can easily uh, pop apart. They're like a segmented straw. Now the inside of these tubes is hollow with the plant matter distributed in a ring on the outside. This is kind of similar to a drinking straw. Now each segment is called an inner node with a node that fits into the next segment. This is a remarkable adaptation that allows the plant to easily break and regrow segments. This is an adaptation to herbivory as animals that feed on horsetails would not completely uproot and kill the entire plant. But it would allow for the upper portions to be sacrificed and later regrown after being browsed. At the end of this lecture, I'll talk a little bit about what these herbivores likely were. Now, many modern and fossil horsetails have a ring of small leaves that extends out from the node. These grow in a circle around the node and provide for an additional surface area for photosynthesis. These small radial leaves are called microphylls, a word we encountered when we discussed fossil club moss. Now, unlike the large macrophylls that you find in ferns, Horsetails have narrow, small leaves that lack the broad fronds that you see in ferns and later plants. Some horsetails in the fossil record do expand the microfill somewhat to resemble more leafy leaves. Now, like bryophytes, club moss, and ferns, the horsetails are also spore-bearing plants. At the end of each stalk is the sporangia, a spore-bearing cone that appears during parts of the year. Now, unlike the spore-bearing springia that we've previously seen, such as the capsule-like ends of primitive bryophytes and in the fossil cooksonia, the springia is arranged in a spiral cluster. This cone-like springia are believed to have evolved from a plant that exhibited spore-bearing springia along the tips of leaves, which have been retracted into the axis of the plant and concentrated in a cluster at the tip of the plant. The spore-bearing cone part of the plant is called the strombolus, which contains many sporangia pores, each supporting a sporangium, the spore-bearing part of the plant. Now, each of the strombolus spore-bearing cones is supported by a unique vascularization. Now, rather than having a thick interior of coelom in the stems, the horsetails support their tall stalks with an open, hollow center. These are surrounded by smaller tubes encased with a stiff cellular wall. Now the ring of canals on the edge of this hollow center are called the carnal canals, while the large valicar canals are beneath the fleshy stiff epidermis on the outside. Now with this arrangement, the stalks are rather stiff, and you would think that this would not be enough to support much growth. However, using the air-filled central canal as a structural support and with the added benefit of the reduction in weight with the air-filled center, the horsetails can get several meters high and, as we can see in the fossil record, get to be the size of large trees. Now, also remember that these tall stalks are the sporophyte generation and that the small gametophyte generation still is required for the life cycle of horsetails. Now the life cycle of horsetails is similar to what we saw with the club moss and the ferns. A hidden gametophyte generation is buried in the ground and during the wet season the gametophytes produce hundreds and thousands of sperm which swim in the water to find eggs in the archegodium. To fertilize the egg to produce a zygote it develops into the sporophyte generation which is the large part of the plant that bears spores through meiosis which then grow into the gametophytes. Now, one unique thing about modern horsetails is that the spores exhibit elaters. Now, elaters are these tiny 
thread-like extensions off the spore, me spore membrane that extend out from the spore, and they actually help it to catch air currents. So when they fall in a moist environment, the elaters actually change. They, they form instead a sticky surface that allows the spore to stick to the moist surface. If the ground that they land on is dry, the elater does not form a sticky surface, and the spore is free to keep blowing down the road. So now if we look at a typical gametophyte generation in the wet ground, we see that it contains the simplest of structures. A few cells that compose the thallus, a few rhizids that hold the plant down, and within the archegodium in this image, we have a sprouting baby sporophyte generation. Now today, there's only one genus of horsetail, Equicetum, which is split into 25 or so species. It's the relic of a, of a much more diverse ancient group of Sphineopsian plants that's only recorded in the fossil record. So we can regard Ectocetum as a living fossil plant, which at least provides us some ideas about what the past flora may have been like. The modern Equicetum has a wide range of temperature tolerances and can live in very cold climates today. It's thought that the fossil Sphineopsins may have had a similar wide range of climate tolerances and could be found in colder regions not supportive to club moss and ferns. However, modern horsetails do require a wetland or seasonally wet ground to grow well. Often the stalks of horsetails can grow far from the sources of water, but they can't grow in a really dry desert environment without a local source of water. The fossil record of Sphineopsins goes all the way back to the Devonian when they originated alongside the earliest vascular plants. Now during the Carboniferous they became very diverse, including the group called the Calmatici, which were rather large and dominant in the Pennsylvanian. Now during the Permian, and even across into the Permian Triassic, the horsetails did rather well, with Equicedians becoming the dominant group. Now during the Triassic and Jurassic, the horsetails were widespread. But as for the Cretaceous, the horsetails started in losing out in diversity. Now this drop in diversity of the Sphineopsids and the horsetails during the Cretaceous might reflect the competition with modern angiosperms, the origin of today's grasses, which could grow in dry environments and may have outcompeted the grass-like horsetails. All right, so let's dive into the fossil record and look at some of these fossil Sphineopsins. This is hyena, a fossil from the Middle Devonian. Now this Sphineopsin plant exhibits many shoots that extends from a central basal stalk with fronds of microfill leaves with clusters of sporangia pores. This plant does not really closely resemble modern horsetails, but exhibits the features that make it perhaps uh, closely related to the group, um, possibly a transitional fossil. Now, not much is known about the vascular tissues of this plant, which might help to determine its relationship to later groups. Now, the first fossil that really shows a more modern horsetail condition is the middle Devonian Clamatophyton, which appears to have had a more segmented stalk with a primitive node inner nodes, as well as small microfills that extended from a central stalk or stem. These rings of microfills are not necessarily symmetrical like in modern horsetails. One of the more common Sphineopsid fossils found in the Carboniferous is the genus Sphineophyllum, which exhibits larger microfills projecting from the nodes symmetrically in rings. There are either six or nine leaves to each ring. Now, Sphenius phylum is believed to grow like a bush with sprouting stalks extending from a central stalk, although fossils showing this arrangement may be um, just pure conjecture. The leaves are rather broad for a Sphineopsid in Sphenia phylum, and the study of the vascular stems show that they lack the hollow center and rather have an array of canals through the stalk. However, they do have clusters of secondary xylem along the stems, indicating uh, possibly some segmentation of the stalks. In some ways, the central stalks resemble the vascularization found in ferns. Now, the related Bomatis, also from the Carboniferous, uh, more closely resembles a, a modern horsetails that we have, with its clusters of microfills along a segmented single stalk. Now, the similarity between Sphineophyllum and Bomatis 
is most commonly found in the spore-bearing cones, as both fossils have a more complex strombulus with multiple sporangia arranged in a whirling pattern at the top of the stalks. The other major group of fossil cyniopsins in the Carboniferous are the group represented by the giant Calmites. Now, this is a massively large fossil log. It's a small portion of a once giant horsetail that lived during this time. Calamites is a tree-like fossil cyniopsin from the Carboniferous, and they grew into large tree-like plants. Their large size often excludes the group from the same group as modern horsetails, but most paleobotanists group the two together. Now, as you can see from this fossil, the outer surface of the fossil sort of resembles modern horsetail stalks in its growth pattern. In some areas, Calamites would have been the major tree in the Carboniferous forest, growing many meters in height. Now, like modern horsetails, the branches actually would be segmenting off of the nodes in a spiral or whirl from the central trunk. And from these, there would be secondary branches that would also extend out. The tree would be hollow on the inside. In Nova Scotia, along the Joggings Cliffs, are large hollow logs of Calamites. In some of them are preserved amazing fossils of early reptiles which crawled into these upright hollow trunks and then were trapped and failed to escape. Now the fossil record of these Calamite-like fossils extends into the Permian, where the genus Neoclamides is found during the early Permian. Now some paleontologists have suggested that this Neoclamides is a smaller form of its ancestor. It's a, it's a transitional fossil between the large Calamatices, the tree-like horsetails, with the modern horsetails that we have today. However, not everyone agrees with this assessment. But it's just strange to think about, however, that as you step over modern horsetails, that there's this possibility that these simple plants today that you just kind of ignore were once a major part of the vast forests of the Carboniferous. Now, another interesting thing is what happens to the horsetails across the Permian-Triassic uh, boundary. Chinese scientists have been looking at the changes that are preserved in the number of, and diversity of spores and pollen. Now, the spores are produced by plants like ferns, club moss, and horsetails, which require a wet environment to grow into gametophytes, while pollen-producing plants don't have to have the wet requirements. Interestingly, the pattern at the Permian-Triassic boundary in China shows a stepwise change in the amount of pollens to spores, such that there is an initial drop in the floral diversity across the boundary, with a period of time where the spores are still the most abundant, but followed later by an increased proportion of pollen in the sediments. This indicates that there was a long-lasting dry climate in which the spore-bearing plants became less and less abundant. All right, so one last interesting question is we can look at is what were dinosaurs eating during the Triassic and Jurassic? This is the age before we have modern grass. Now, giant dinosaurs like uh, Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, um, they are all Jurassic in age, and they must have been eating plants. But this is a time before we had any angiosperms or modern flowering plants. Hence, all the Jurassic fossil plants belong to just a handful of groups. Now, the teeth of these big sauropod dinosaurs are also very blunt and peg-like. And unlike the teeth found in many Cretaceous dinosaurs, which had dental batteries for grinding teeth, and of course, feeding that we see in mammals today, which eat grass, which grind and chew their food, these giant dinosaurs had peg-like, sort of plucking-like teeth. And they may have used their stomachs to do a lot of the digestion, but they were using these teeth really for plucking whatever plants that they were eating. All right, so these are the types of plants that are available to these giant sauropods to eat during the Jurassic. We have um, really tough cycads here, um, not very nutritious. We have conifers. These would be like the pine trees, um, really tough, tough needles. We have ferns, and many of ferns are poisonous. They can, they can uh, um, concentrate poisons, things like arsenic, in their leaves. And then we have the ginkgos, which are somewhat edible, and they have fruits they'll look at later on nuts. And then we have the horsetails. 
Now, scientists have looked at all these plants that are living today, and they analyzed the amount of nutrition each of these plants provide. And they found that the horsetails provide the most amount of nutrition. And so the horsetails might have been the most readily available food for these dinosaurs. So during the Jurassic, horsetails were likely the, the major food source for these giant, huge dinosaurs. And they would come along and they could pluck off the various portions of these plants and eat them. Now dinosaurs would be browsing horsetails across the wetlands, which could then re quickly regrow to support these massively large creatures that would, of course, need a constant source of food. And the horsetail is basically the, the Mesozoic equivalent of the modern grasses that today feed the large herbivores that we have with us in the modern realm. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this lecture on the fossil record of horsetails, and that the next time you see a horsetail growing, you'll think of dinosaur food and giant hollow trees of the past. All right, thanks for watching. If you're interested in taking a course at Utah State University in Geology, take a look at our webpage at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and my research, stop by my webpage at benjamin.burger.org. Thanks for watching.